Well, I have the uh, joy of introducing our next speaker, who isn't just our next speaker, but is a very dear friend of mine and my wife and many of us, uh, Patty Mansfield and her husband, Al. Patty and Al have been following the Lord for more than 50 years, and they've just been really tremendous disciples of Jesus and witnesses to Jesus. And just like Mary told Lucia she was, need, she was needed to stay around for a while and be a witness to the message of, of Fatima, the Lord's keeping Patty and Al around as witnesses to the beginning of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal in the Catholic Church. Patty was on that original weekend in 1967 in Duquesne University, out of which has come this amazing outpouring of the Holy Spirit that more than 120 million people all over the world have been blessed from. <laughs> Patty and Al are the parents of children and their grandparents, and Patty is just a faithful witness to what God is doing today in his outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So let's welcome Patty. Thank you, Ralph. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. I didn't know if I should say hello or bonjour. <laughs> so hello and bonjour. <laughs> It's wonderful to be here. Um, when I met Ralph Martin, I, I was 20 years old, and he was a little bit older, 24 years old. So we've been knowing each other a very, very long time. And it's a, a joy to actually be here. Because uh, Al and I support Renewal Ministries, and we get the Renewal Ministries newsletter. Isn't that a treasure, that newsletter? It, it's, it's like modern day Acts of the Apostles. I've been knowing when you folks meet here for the Lift Jesus Higher Rally for many years, and we're united. Each time you meet, Al and I are united in interceding for you. I'm going to ask you to work with me to help me give my testimony. Are you willing? Yeah. Are you willing? Okay. Um, I want to start with a question. How many of you want to go to heaven? Let me see a show of hands. Can I see two hands? Look, you're already charismatics, everybody here. Well, I read some years ago something very beautiful that St. John Vianney, better known as the Curie of Ars, said. And this is what he said. If you ask the saints in heaven, how did you get there? They would say, for having obeyed the Holy Spirit. And if you ask the damned in hell, how did you get there? They would say, for having resisted the Holy Spirit. So what I'm going to share with you about in this hour that's been allotted to me is how we can obey and open ourselves up very wide, as wide as Mary did, to the visitation of the Holy Spirit. Because you see, brothers and sisters, Heaven and hell hang in the balance. Ralph did such a beautiful job in bringing home for us the message of Fatima. And there is a heaven, and there is a hell, and you all showed with two hands up in the air that you want to go to heaven. And what I'm going to share with you is my own personal story of how Pentecost became alive for me. I'm not a native of the Deep South. Al and I flew here yesterday from New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm not a native of that area. I actually grew up in Ralph's home state, New Jersey, not far from New York City. I am the, the first child of Netta and Pete Gallagher, who were both children of immigrants, went out to work at a factory at the age of 14. So Catholic school was not a possibility for, for me or for my brother and sisters. It was just too expensive. My, my dad was working in the factory. My mom eventually went to wrap meat in a grocery store. So, um, but in our family, there certainly was a devotion to the Lord, a devotion to the Catholic faith. In fact, I remember one of my earliest memories of being touched by God 
was when I was just a little girl, maybe three, four years old, and before we would go to sleep, my Italian mother would come over and trace a little sign of the cross on our forehead. And she would say, repeat after me, I love you, Jesus, and Jesus is mommy. <laughs> I love you, Jesus, and Jesus is mommy. And you know, just that simple little sign of the cross on my forehead gave me a sense of security. I didn't want to put my head on the pillow until my mother had blessed me. I'm giving you an idea here, moms and grandmas. That touch of my mother's finger on my forehead was one of my first recollections of the presence of God. A little bit later on, when it came time to prepare first, for First Holy Communion, how many of you remember your First Holy Communion? Vividly. Most people do. Well, I remember being prepared for my First Holy Communion by a religious sister. And as a public school kid, I didn't know nuns. And we have a real live nun with us here this weekend. She's a real live nun and a holy nun. Well, you know, Sister Anne, the, the, I think they were Notre Dame sisters. She had an enormous amount of fabric on her. And all you could see was this much of Sister Mary Emmelina's face. But when I saw just this much of Sister's face, I could see she was a woman in love because she had a beautiful glow about her. And as a little seven-year-old girl preparing for First Communion, this is how I felt. I wish in my heart I could feel the way she looks on her face. It was another moment of being touched by the presence of God in a religious sister. I wouldn't have known what consecrated virginity was, but I could see on her face that radiance of someone who is filled with the love of Jesus. Then, uh, preparing for confirmation, um, I learned a hymn that has really become a, a defining uh, hymn in my life, and it's the hymn, Come Holy Ghost. We're going to sing it later, not right now. I didn't know. It, it, don't start singing it now. We're going to do it like, Come Holy Ghost, Creator. Okay. Well, from the first time I heard that hymn, I was 12 at the time, I had a sense almost that I should do this. There was some sense, even though I was a public school kid, that there was something so holy about those words, come Holy Ghost, creator blessed. Uh, as you know, the bishop asks questions at confirmation, and guess what question I got to answer? What is confirmation? Oh, man, I put my hand up. I knew that answer. Confirmation is that sacrament by which we receive the Holy Spirit and we become strong and perfect Christians and soldiers of Jesus Christ. I must be older than a lot of you. I guess the, the definition may have changed a little bit. I, as a little girl, being a soldier of Jesus Christ didn't really appeal to me. But as I went through my high school years, I was in a big public school in Irvington, New Jersey. I had only one Catholic girlfriend, two Protestant girlfriends. Everybody else in my life was a Jew. I mean, the Feinsteins and the Goldmans. And, and the boy who captured my heart was a very fervent Jew. In fact, now he's a famous Jewish rabbi. And yes, Rabbi Eugene Korn, he lives in Jerusalem. And meeting Eugene and having a, a real caring, you know, friendship with him, it made a, a great difference to me because his parents didn't want him to date me because I was a Gentile. I, I didn't even know what a Gentile was. I, I, I didn't know I was a Gentile, but you know, that experience of being discriminated against and being in a very sort of multi uh, uh, multi-religious environment made me realize that I did need the Holy Spirit so that I could bear witness to Christ. Well, since Eugene couldn't date me, I said to myself that I need to get in a Catholic environment. I want to go, I had my whole list of criteria. I wanted to go to a university in a big city. I grew up right outside of New York City. I wanted a good, strong modern language department because I fell in love with French and I wanted to, to be a French teacher. I wanted a good ratio, 
not of students to teachers, of men to women. You're supposed to be laughing now because, you see, I had my whole life planned at this point. I thought, you know, I want, I want to study French. I'd like to be a French teacher, but really, I want to go to France for at least a semester or summer, perfect my French accent, meet a debonair Frenchman who will sweep me off my feet, will get married and live happily in his chateau. That was the plan. And so, was I a person of prayer at this time? Well, I would say, yes, I was a person of prayer, but my prayer was like this. Dear Lord, bless my plans and do my will according to my timetable. And usually you're too slow. Amen. Now, was this prayer, you could say, well, no, I think it was prayer. I was talking to God. I wasn't listening very much. But I was in a kind of role confusion. I was praying as if I were God, the creator, and he were my creature, and he existed simply to do my bidding. Okay. That, was my, that was my kind of prayer. So in 1964, I started as a freshman at Duquesne University. The full title is Duquesne University of the Holy Spirit. The motto of that university is from John's Gospel, it is the spirit that gives life. And the religious order that operates Duquesne University is the, are, were the Holy Ghost Fathers, now known as the Spiritans. Do you have them here in Canada? Okay. Well, I started, and uh, I remember the first, uh, I, I really wanted to grow closer to God. I wanted to know the scripture. I wanted to pray better. I really wanted to learn more intellectually about this Catholic faith that caused me to be discriminated against by my Jewish friend. And so, uh, you know, the study of theology, uh, theology 101, 102, by my sophomore year, I realized something very important. And I would think that most people attending this rally have already realized this, but just in case anyone hasn't, I'm going to say it to you straight out. It's not enough to simply know about God. It's not enough to simply have all the knowledge up here intellectually. And what I got in touch with was that what I was really hungry for and thirsty for was not just to know about God, but to know God, to experience him. And I had a very dear friend who was a daily communicant, and she began to tell me about a scripture study group that she was part of called Kiro. And for one solid year, this friend invited me to come to this scripture study with her. And for one year, I came up with every creative reason why I couldn't go. You see, I wanted to keep her friendship, and although I wanted to know more about the Lord and grow closer to him, I didn't want to get to be too religious, too holy. I was afraid that if I looked like I was too religious, it would, it would really cut into my social life, you see. And because I was very much interested in meeting my debonair Frenchman and in getting married, I thought if I start hanging out with people who might even be thinking of being priests or nuns or who carried their Bibles around with them, who, Ralph is laughing, <laughs> who would ever want to marry me? Well, after one year, this friend said, we're having a picnic. It was Ascension Thursday. She said, why don't you just come to the picnic? And you know, we're, we're very interested, we Catholics, in the new evangelization. That picnic was a great evangelistic tool because just getting in that setting of playing games and eating hot dogs and hamburgers, I saw that these people from the scripture study group were wonderful people. They were so loving to me, so friendly. And their friendliness and their love made me decide when I get back to campus as a junior, I'm going to join Key Row. It didn't have anything to do with the fellow who was president, who was a blonde-haired, <laughs> blue-eyed. Anyway, Al knows all this. You don't have to look at him saying this. He realized that this is his wife's past. When I joined, when I joined the Key Row Scripture uh, Study Group, 
Again, something so simple, but the Lord used it to touch me. We would pray a short form of the divine office. And we would stand in a circle, and when it came to the doxology, glory be to the Father and to the Son, everybody bowed like this. I had never seen that before. And so not to look strange, I bowed like this too. <laughs> glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. And then they stood up. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without it, end, amen. Sisters, you're nodding. When I bowed like that, something happened inside. It was like something got awakened in me. I was created to praise God. I was created to know him and to worship him, just that simple gesture. Well, it was this scripture study group that made a retreat in February, February 17th through 19th, 1967, that was focused on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. You know, brothers and sisters, I hadn't given any thought to the Holy Spirit since I was 12, and I was confirmed and I answered that question for the bishop, and I felt so proud of myself. And so we were told that we should do three things to prepare for the retreat. And I'm going to give you this as an assignment. Are you well, willing to take an assignment? Yes. Are you willing to take an assignment? Yes. All right, I'm going to come back and check. These are the three things I was asked to do and I'm asking you to do. First, pray with expectant faith. In other words, expect God to answer your prayer. This day, today, this Lift, Lift Jesus Higher Valley can absolutely change your life. And it can change the lives of those that you love, that are close to you, and those that the Lord is going to bring into your life. When Ralph went to Fatima, Al and I had been in Fatima the year before, I don't know, Ralph, if you would have realized before you went there that you were going to receive such an enormous grace that then you would go and tell people about that Jacinta and Francisco and Lucia and... But in that moment when Ralph was there, something happened that then has marked him in this year since. And this, this day, for those of you who have not yet had a pen, personal Pentecost, this day could radically change your life. Amen? Yay! And so, Oh, yes. And so first, pray with expectant faith. Second, we were told to take our Bibles and read the first four chapters of the Acts of the Apostles. I'm looking at my musicians here because they are fabulous, aren't they? Yes. Wow, wow. So I had no idea where to find the Acts of the Apostles. That's how ignorant I was of the scripture. I figured it was the New Testament because I knew the apostles lived in New Testament times. As you probably know, in those first chapters of the Acts is the story of Pentecost. How these people, these disciples who knew Jesus intimately well, who heard him preach, who saw his miracles, who saw him die and risen from the dead, how they were still behind locked doors because they were afraid. But Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost came, when the Holy Spirit descended upon them, everything changed. They were no longer behind locked doors. They were out on the streets preaching, bearing witness to the resurrection of Jesus. And even when they were beaten, even when they were thrown into prison, they said, we can't help ourselves. We have to proclaim what we have seen and heard. And so I read that, and I didn't read those first four chapters once. I read it over and over and over again. Why? Because I thought everybody else who went to Catholic school is going to get more out of this than I did. I didn't want to miss the message. So that's your assignment. Pray with expectant faith. Second, read the Acts of the Apostles at least four chapters. The third thing we were told to do was read a little paperback book called The Cross and the Switchblade. Have any of you heard of that? Cross the Switchblade. You know, you can get it online. I ordered it not too long ago. It's a very dramatic story of a Pentecostal minister from a small town in Pennsylvania who's led into the streets of New York City to work with drug addicts, prostitutes. And, and as I read that book, I kept thinking, I'm a Catholic. I've received the Holy Spirit. 
why isn't the Spirit doing these kinds of things in my life? This minister seemed to hear from God, be led by God. And I was thinking it would be so wonderful if I could be led by God. And I remember as I finished the first four chapters of the Acts, as I finished the cross and switchblade, I was alone in my dormitory room. I didn't have a lot of faith. I had a mustard seed of faith. You know what Jesus said about the mustard seed? If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be uprooted and cast into the sea and it would be done and nothing would be impossible. So I had that little tiny mustard seed. I knelt in my room alone and this is what I said to the Lord. I said, Lord, as a Catholic, because I wanted him to know, I just read a Protestant book, I want him to know that for my part, I was praying as a Catholic. As a Catholic, I believe I've already received your spirit in the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. But, and that word but is really like a word that causes us to take a leap. I said, but, if your spirit can do more in my life than he's done till now, I want it. And when I said those words, I want it, I really meant it. And so I opened my eyes and I looked around the room. What was I looking for? I don't know. An angel? An apparition? Maybe Our Lady coming to me? Like, I was looking for something, at least kind of like a warm, fuzzy feeling, you know, a little goosebumps or something. Do you know what I felt in that moment? Absolument rien. Nothing, nada, zip. I, I didn't feel anything, and so I said to myself, I guess it didn't work. I guess I'm too ordinary. All I want to do is get married and have babies. I, I, don't, I don't have any special call on my life. I, even though we were studying the documents of Vatican II, the whole universal call to holiness just went right over my head. I thought, this is just for priests, nuns, pe people with a special mission. I don't have any special mission. I guess it didn't work. But brothers and sisters, alone in that dormitory room when I said, Lord, if your spirit can do more in my life than he's done up until now, I want it. I really meant it. You know what I was praying for? I was praying for the grace to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, I didn't feel the answer to my prayer then. But I did within a few days. And I'm going to use this chair. I don't know if, uh, if it's possible for you to see it on the screen. If, well, this chair represents the heart of a person's life. You might say the throne of a person's life. In the life of a person who does not know Jesus, doesn't know God, that person can be sitting on the throne of his or her life. I like to refer to it as an unholy trinity of me, myself, me, myself, and I. I'm number one, it's what I want, it's what I say, it's how I determine. This person, the self-centered person, is absolutely miserable miserable. It makes everybody around them miserable. The call of the gospel, which I had not yet heeded at the point that I made that prayer alone in my, in my uh, bedroom, the call of the gospel is for you and me to freely choose to vacate the throne, to step aside and to invite Jesus to be the Lord, Jesus to sit on the throne of our lives, Jesus to be the center of our lives. Now, amen. Where was I at the point that I made that prayer alone in my room? Well, I wasn't sitting on the throne. I mean, after all, I had chosen to go to a Catholic university. I had joined a scripture study group. I was making a retreat that coming weekend. I wasn't sitting on the throne. I had been making, watch, more and more room for Jesus. I was making lots of room for Jesus. But it was like a co-pilot situation, you see? Sometimes my will, and sometimes your will. 
Sometimes my way and sometimes your way. Sometimes my word and sometimes your word. I had not yet made that radical, unconditional surrender of my life to Jesus as the Lord. I was still saying, bless my plans and do my will when I tell you to, amen. Okay. Well, I prayed alone in my room. Off we went, about 25 students. And this book that Peter, uh, that Pete held up as by a new Pentecost tells the whole story. I wrote it in obedience to my husband. He told me I had to write this book. And he wouldn't leave me alone until I had done it. This book tells the whole story, how there were about 25 students from this scripture study group that went off to a beautiful retreat house, the Ark and the Dove, right outside of Pittsburgh. And every time we gathered, we gathered in an upper room chapel. Interesting, it was an upper room. The, um, there was a meditation, right in the very beginning, we were told, every time we have a session, we're going to sing a special hymn to the Holy Spirit. And the hymn was the Veni Creator Spiritus, Come Creator Spirit. And here in North America, the way we sing that is, not yet, come Holy <laughs> Ghost, the come Holy Ghost, Creator blessed and in our souls take up thy rest, come with thy grace and heavenly aid to fill the hearts which thou hast made. And I, I had never heard the, I heard the melody we sing, I'd never heard the Gregorian chant. And you know how that Gregorian chant is so mysterious, it's so mystical. It's, and so there we were in an upper room chapel, united in prayer, invoking the Holy Spirit. The very next thing was a meditation on this beautiful woman. Now, it wasn't a depiction like this. It was just the bust of Mary, very contemporary, and her hands were like this. A very charismatic gesture of prayer. And as the professor who was giving the meditation was speaking to us, Mary is our mother. Mary is the model of humility, of surrender, of docility to the spirit. I was thinking, but he sounds spirit-filled. I don't think I'd ever even heard the expression. But I could see a change had come over that man. What we didn't know at that moment, but we later found out, was that he, another professor from Duquesne University, uh, and his wife, and yet another instructor in theology, that they had been, those four, had been on a search for a long time for a personal Pentecost. They knew they needed more from the Holy Spirit than they had. And as they were, in fact, they decided they would pray every day for a greater coming of the Holy Spirit. And they used another hymn of our church, the sequence hymn of Pentecost that we pray in the liturgy every Pentecost. And during the months that especially two of them were praying, some friends, one of them named Ralph Martin and another Steve Clark, I believe, sent these professors from Duquesne two books, the, the Cross and the Switchblade I've already mentioned, and another book was given to them called They Speak with Other Tongues by John Sherrill. And as the, our, our professors, a full month before our retreat, read those books, they said, you know the term that keeps coming up is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This baptism in the Holy Spirit sounds like what we want, what we're hungering for. And that led them to find a, an interdenominational prayer group, little home prayer group in Pittsburgh, where one month before our retreat, they went to pay a visit. And while they were there, for one of them on the first visit, for another on the second visit, they asked for the grace to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. They came back to campus. I could see it on the face of the one who was speaking about Mary. This glow, this radiance of something special that they had received. But they didn't say a word to us about it. All they did was point us to the word of God, the Acts of the Apostles, and to read the testimony of this minister in the cross and switchblade. And so there was a meditation on Our Lady. The very next thing that happened, and Sister Anne, I believe, is going to be speaking about this this afternoon, was a call to repent. There was a communal penance service. I'd never been in a communal penance service before. You know, it was just a small chapel. Everybody was sitting on the floor. 
And the Holy Ghost Father who was leading us, you know, he was there in the front. But at a certain point, there was just spontaneous prayer. Ralph, when you said when people had that sense our lady was coming, they were calling out their sins. I'd never heard anything like that before. But, you know, as we were sitting there, some of my friends would say, oh, Lord, forgive me for my pride. And then someone else would say, forgive me for my lust. Forgive me for my greed. Forgive me for my jealousy. Can, f forgive me for my competitiveness. Lord, forgive me, forgive me. I was blown away. Not because of their sins, but because their sins sounded just like my sins. I didn't know the scripture well enough, but now I know. St. Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners in need of repentance. And brothers and sisters, if you want today to change your life, whether you've already experienced a personal Pentecost, whether you're already baptized in the Spirit, or this is the first time you're even hearing that such a thing is available, brothers and sisters, we have to repent. Just since I've been on this stage, it's like veils being lifted and I'm seeing more of the condition of my own heart and I'm saying to the Lord, Lord forgive me, Lord forgive me, Lord forgive me. It's a grace. It's not unto condemnation. It's a grace because as we see how far short we fall of the glory of God, we can repent and then open ourselves up really wide to receive light and peace and love. Amen? Amen. And so there was a communal penance service. We went uh, to confess our sins, receive absolution. The next day, there was a pivotal moment. There was a woman who was going to speak on Acts chapter 2, which is the Pentecost account. And um, she was introduced this way. Our friend is a Protestant, and she's going to share with you her experience of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So this lady stands up, and she said something like this. Well, I don't know what, very feminine. Well, I don't know what I'm going to say, but I ask the Holy Spirit to guide me. And I sat there thinking, here she is a Protestant, coming to Catholic University students. She doesn't have the courtesy to prepare a talk. Now she thinks the Holy Spirit is going to fly down from heaven and save her out of her mess. So, I'm revealing something of myself to you. So, I sat with my arms crossed like this, kind of like, huh. Interiorly, I'm saying, go ahead. Show me your Holy Spirit. And you know what? She did. <laughs> she started talking about Jesus Christ like they had just had coffee that morning. She had an intimacy with Jesus that I could only dream about. But when she spoke about the Holy Spirit, it was clear that for her, the Holy Spirit wasn't some dove flying around or some tongue of fire in a stained glass window. She knew the Holy Spirit, the person, the third person of the Blessed Trinity. She knew the Holy Spirit. He led her. He guided her. All my resistance fell away. In fact, we were given a notebook at the beginning of that retreat. Here it is, 51 years old. We were given a notebook, on the back it says 25 cents. That shows you how long ago it was. And in my notes during that woman's talk, all my resistance fell away. This is, this is what I wrote. Jesus, be real for me. I knew that whatever that woman had, I didn't have. And it was very attractive. Be real for me. We got into a, a small group afterwards. And I share this because it may be a question uh, in the minds of some of you. We kept saying to our professor, but we're Catholic. <laughs> Why are we even talking about receiving Jesus? Isn't that what happens in baptism? Isn't that what we do when we go up to communion? And what about receiving the Holy Spirit? Isn't that what the sacrament of confirmation did? And the professor said to us, yes, the sacraments work. But most of us were infants when we were baptized. We were very young when we re received first penance, first, uh, first Holy Communion. I was 12 when I was confirmed. Nowadays, it's maybe more like 16 or 17. But he said to us, you were young. Now you're an adult. You need to make a decision. 
and he didn't talk about this chair, but that's what I'm talking about. We need to make a decision, every one of us, to vacate the chair, to repent of our self-centeredness and our sin, and invite Jesus to be the Lord. And you know, as he was speaking, it's not like I saw a vision of Jesus, but interiorly, I guess it was, Ralph, an interior enlightenment. It was as if the living Jesus were looking right in my eyes. And he was asking me the same question he asked the disciples long ago. He was saying to me, but you, Patty, who do you say that I am? And you know, I had to admit that although I did know him and I did love him, and I was making choices to get closer to him, I had not yet made that unconditional surrender of everything, my future, my hopes, my dreams to him and to his lordship. Well, one of the young men in the group whose testimony is in this book, his name is David Mangan, very close friend of the people here on stage. David said, you know, we Catholics renew our baptismal promises every year at the Easter vigil. He said, I'd like to propose that at the close of this retreat, we have a renewal of confirmation where we can say our yes, amen to the graces of confirmation. And it was proposed to the whole group and nobody much was interested. I thought it was a brilliant idea. I, I didn't even know David. We had just met uh, on maybe that morning. But the two of us went for a walk around the grounds and we said to one another, even if no one else wants to renew confirmation, we do. And we went up to one of the professors to tell him of our decision, and we linked our arms like this. And we said, even though no one else is interested, we're interested, we're gonna renew our confirmation. And the professor looked at us in the eyes and he said, are you ready? It scared me to death. <laughs> said, are you ready? Like he knew something was going to happen. Well, I didn't know if I was ready. David didn't know if he was ready, but the desire was there. And so we said, yes, we're ready. Later that afternoon, first David, and then a few hours afterwards, I wandered into the chapel alone. I'm giving you a very short version of this day. When I entered the chapel that evening, there was supposed to be a birthday party going on down in the, in the living room, but it just wasn't getting off the ground. And so I went into the chapel not to pray. I went up to see if any of the students were in the chapel to tell them, come down to the birthday party. But brothers and sisters, when I entered the chapel that night and I knelt down in the presence of Jesus in the blessed sacrament, he was reserved in the tabernacle, I began to tremble. I have a tremor in my later years, just a hereditary tremor. It wasn't that. I was trembling all over because I was looking at that tabernacle and I was aware for the first time in my life as a Catholic, what we mean, we Catholics, when we say the real presence. I remember kneeling and, and, and saying, but God is here and he's holy and I'm not holy. If I stay here in the presence of this holy God, Something's going to happen to me. He's going to ask something of me. I better get out of here quick. <laughs> the desire to run away, to flee, to escape, to have my own life, my own. Send me the, send me the debonair Frenchman. I want to live in a chateau. <laughs> but overriding, bigger than my fear, was my need my need to surrender, and brothers and sisters, that need to surrender unconditionally to God who loves us is in every single human heart. It's in your heart today. And so just in the quiet of my heart, there were maybe three other kids in the chapel, just in the quiet of my heart as I was kneeling there before Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, I remember exactly what I said. It was directed to the Father. I said, Father, I give my life to you. And whatever you ask of me, I accept it. And if it means suffering, I accept that too. Just 
teach me to follow your son Jesus and to love the way Jesus loves. And I prayed that prayer kneeling, and the next moment, I found myself prostrate, flat on my face. Somehow, my shoes came off in the process. I've had a theologian tell me it was appropriate because you were on holy ground. As I was lying there prostrate, I felt immersed from the tips of my fingertips down to my, my feet. I felt immersed in the love of God. I felt like I wanted to die. I remember thinking, if I could just die, if this is heaven, I don't want to wait. This is, you know, as you were a little kid, why did God make you? God made us to know him, to love him, to serve him in this life, and to be happy. I never understood how being with God in heaven was going to be happiness, but in that moment, I tasted. You know, the psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Sometimes the Lord is sweet, some translations say. As I was tasting the, the sweetness, the mercy, the tenderness of God, I knew that night, as a little 20-year-old girl who didn't go to Catholic school, who had never made a retreat before in her life, who still wanted to sit, uh, at least sit partially on the throne, I knew that night, 51 years ago, what I know today, that if I, who am nobody special, if I could experience the love, the mercy, the tenderness of the Lord that way, anyone across the face of the earth could, as much as I wanted to just stay. You know, St. Augustine says, praise, oh Lord, you have made us for yourself. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. As much as I wanted to just rest and be with him and never leave him, I knew then, what I know now, that this grace was for everybody, tout le monde, for everybody. So I got up, I said to the two or three there, I said, I pray this happens to you, Jesus is alive. Ran down, got the chaplain, and are there priests here beside the one that I said to? I see here, other priests. I went and got the priest, and that's what we Catholics do when we've had a powerful experience of God. We're looking for guidance, we're looking for the priest, we're looking for validation. I went, I poured out my story, and listen to this. He said that David Mangan had been into the chapel before me and had an identical experience. You know what Ralph was saying? Every hair on our head is numbered. God has a personal... Can you imagine that God on high, the holy God, was looking down to see two kids link their arms and say, even if no one else wants to renew their confirmation, we do. He was looking at us. He was listening to us. And when he decided to pour out this grace of baptism in the Spirit on that weekend, he chose David first, who had the proposal, and shortly thereafter, the other one who linked arms. And so I said, well, Father, what should I do? Who should I tell? He said, the Lord's going to show you. And as I left him, two young girls who... We had just come that week and I didn't know each other. They came up and they told me that my face was glowing. They said, Patty, what, what happened to you? I don't think they said, come over you. What happened to you? Your face looks different. You see, brothers and sisters, I didn't know my face looked different. But I took them by the hand. I said, I've experienced what we've been talking about this weekend. Come in the chapel with me. We went, knelt down in front of that tabernacle. I had one girl on each side. And this is what I was saying. This isn't fancy theological terminology. I said, Jesus, whatever you just did for me, do it for them. That's the shortest Life in the Spirit seminar on record. I don't even know what to call it. All I know is I don't deserve it. Jesus, whatever you did for me, do it for them. Within maybe an hour, not all, but about half the students on that retreat were sovereignly drawn into that chapel. Nobody rang a bell, said time for chat. No, no. There was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that drew many of those other young people. And you know, we were kneeling there. Some people were weeping. We're weeping. When the Holy Spirit touches us at times, tears. One of the saints calls it liquid love. You know, tears just come. Some were laughing, laughing like little children. And later they said, I realized God loves me. 
God loves me. Others were putting their hands up like this. Brothers and sisters, in 1967, the only Catholics who prayed with their hands up like this were priests at Mass. But it was a spontaneous gesture. I felt like my whole body was on fire. My hands, my arms. And in walked one of the professors, and he said, what's the bishop going to say <laughs> when he hears that all of these kids have been baptized in the Holy Spirit? It's the first time I heard that term. The rest of the story is in my book, how we got back onto campus. You know, we created quite a stir. I had um, a friend of mine say, are you going to be a nun? I said, I, I don't think so. He said, but, but you look like you're drunk. At which point I took my Bible, I opened to the Acts of the Apostles, and I said, and his name was David also. David, I said, that's exactly what they said after Pentecost. And I think when I opened the Bible, it really freaked him out because it, it was so unusual for me to be carrying a Bible and opening and quoting a passage. Well, brothers and sisters, this, you would say, very humble beginning has given birth to what Cardinal Sunings called, and now Pope Francis calls, a current of grace. And I want to issue you an invitation today to swim in this current of grace. This grace of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, which Ralph preaches on so beautifully, is not the invention of the charismatic renewal. The term being baptized in the Spirit is in all four Gospels and in the Acts of the Apostles. Our present Holy Father, well, you remember the, 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 the question the professor said, What's the bishop going to say when he hears that all these kids have been baptized in the Spirit? May I tell you what the bishop of Rome has said about this grace? Well, go back to John the 23rd. Renew your wonders, John the 23rd prayed. Renew your wonders in this day as by a new Pentecost. Paul the sixth, and I, Al and I weren't there, I believe Ralph was there, called this great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this grace of baptism in the Spirit, a chance for the church. John Paul the second. In 1998 and again in 2004, said these wonderful words, I would like to cry out to all Christians everywhere, open yourselves to the Holy Spirit, accept with gratitude and obedience the charisms which the Holy Spirit never ceases to bestow. Our dear Pope Emeritus Benedict, and this quote is on the cover of the As by a New Pentecost DVD, which is the Life in the Spirit and DVD, Pope Benedict said, let us rediscover, dear brothers and sisters, the grace of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And Pope Francis, when Alan, uh, when, uh, well, Al was with me, Ralph and I and some others from the States, in 2014, meeting with Pope Francis, Pope Francis said this, share with the whole church the grace of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, I would like to give you an opportunity today to receive that grace. Remember how I started this presentation? How many want to go to heaven? Let me see it again. How many want to go to heaven? Two hands. <laughs> Remember, the Lord looks at these gestures. Huh? Curie of ours said, if you ask the saints in heaven, how did you get there? They'd say, for having obeyed, listened to, yielded to the Holy Spirit. If you ask the damned in hell, they would say, for having resisted, contradicted the Holy Spirit. Let's take, I'm going to ask you to stand. Let's take a moment of silence before I lead you in prayer. And in this silence, I ask you, O oh Holy Spirit, to search our hearts, every one of our hearts, starting with mine, and reveal to us any resistance that we have to you. Reveal to us, O oh Holy Spirit, any way in which we are offending Jesus the Lord. any way in which we are doubting the love of our Heavenly Father. Let's just be still.
I've been reminded just recently, just in the last few months, of one of our saints, St. Angela Foligno, not, not very well known. But she came to a point in her life where she realized that although she loved God, it was always by half measures. And the Lord spoke to her and he said, it is no joke that I have loved you. And coming under conviction of how she was not yet wholehearted for him, she made this beautiful statement. She said, I want God. I want God. I want God. And I'm going to hold up just my little traveling crucifix. I didn't know if you would have a big one here or not. And I would like to invite you to repeat after me this prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you today desiring to renew my baptismal promises. I believe in your love, Father. I want to do your will for my life. I thank you for sending your son Jesus to suffer and die for me on the cross. Lord Jesus, I repent of all my sins. I turn away from sin and I turn toward you and your plan for my life. With your help, I intend to break with sin and to avoid all that leads me to sin. Lord Jesus, occupy the throne of my life. I step aside and I ask you to reign and rule. I want to live for you from now on. Lord Jesus, I ask you to do for me what was done in the upper room on Pentecost. Baptize me in your Holy Spirit. Fill me to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. I open myself wide, even as Mary did, to the charisms of your Holy Spirit. Give me now whatever you desire for me. And I yield my voice and my tongue to you, that I might praise you. Amen. Amen. I'm going to just say a word to you, then we're going to sing the Come Holy Ghost. Brothers and sisters, by the grace of God, not through any merit of my own, I've had the privilege to preach all over the world. And each time I speak about this great gift of the baptism in the spirit, I encourage people to yield to the gift of tongues. I didn't even know what the gift of tongues was. As a French major, it offended me to think that people could come into a language they didn't have to study. I thought, I'm working so hard to perfect my French. I didn't even like the idea that people could, well, guess what? I was sitting next to David Mangan at one of our first prayer meetings, and David started praying in French. And I understood everything he was saying. And that convinced me, although we don't always know the language, and sometimes it can be like a preconceptual speech, this gift of tongues is for tout le monde. In the upper room, Mary was there, and it says they were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I would say, after 51 years of walking in the Spirit, this one charismatic gift is the most precious to me. I've experienced many, many, many of them, not as a ministry, but from time to time. But this gift of tongues is for us personally, to build us up, to praise God, and it's also for ministry. So let's put our hands up. And I'm going to encourage you right now, if you've never prayed in tongues before, this is your chance. We're all going to, we're all going to yield together. Stop speaking English, French, whatever other language you speak. And just like a little child begin making some sounds, 
there's a French, well, he's, he's dead now, a French founder of a community, and he said, think of yourself at the first Christmas, leaning over baby Jesus, would you say, oh, most divine and holy Lord? You'd probably say, up, 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 up. So to humble ourselves, if you've already prayed in tongues, you've been using that gift for many years, leave aside the language you've been using and begin to yield to a new language. Let's sing, come Holy Ghost, and then we're going to pray in tongues. The sound of Pentecost will fill this room. Come Holy Ghost. Leave your hands up. If it's hard, then let's do it as a little sacrifice. If the team would begin to sing out a little loudly, go 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 Yield your lips and your tongue so that your ears can hear what you're saying. Oh Take a step in faith, brothers and sisters. Open your mouth so that the Lord will fill it with his praises. O totoya abedepe arliamba paya ya kukuya liea ya shabedepe arliamba paya ya kataya or liepedepe ya kaya ya on totoya abedepe ya shabedepe lia kakan totoya abedepe ya kata or ria papaya ya kataya ya horriembedepe ya shabedepe lian totoya ya kataya or lia ya ya kakaya ya tototo Liembe pea ya shabadabaya, or liangaka, o koko, arlia. Open your lips and praise the Lord. Take a step in faith just like Peter did when he stepped out of the boat. And there was only water, but he was able to walk on water to do the impossible because he took a step of faith. O riabade pea ya, liangoko, ya kakaralia. Lio shabadepea arliandetea, liaka kar riabadepea ya, o riembretea ya shabaya ya, o koko riembretea, lio riebretea arliangaka, yo totoya arliakata, o popor liambapaya. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah.